Hello, everybody, and welcome to our August webinar. Today, we're joined by Graham Kerr from Berenbrug, and he's going to talk to us about pasture and pasture renewal and tie it back into LUDIF as well. So I'll hand it over to you, Graham, if you want to go ahead. Um, thank you, Claire. And I'm very pleased to uh, be invited to talk about pasture renewal as sort of for the Canterbury and I guess irrigated to the whole South Island region. Um, and I guess I've, I've had a career in pasture that's, um, that, that, that I've developed a bit of an eye for, for what's happening and some of the things that we need to think about. So I'll fire in with a presentation, but happy to take questions as we go. and. Um, Happy to take questions at the end, I guess, Claire. So, um, and you'll monitor that. And um, so I'll share the screen. And find the right thing. So we're magically outside at the LEDF, which is where I'd much rather be with this presentation than um, inside and, and standing on a pasture. And um, I think uh, it, the, the pasture side is so important in our, our, our agricultural systems, and I'm pretty passionate about the subject uh, because it's a natural advantage, um, because it's environmentally friendly um, compared to a lot of other things we feed cows, because it's a complete feed. And, and I guess that the magic of pasture, and I'll tell you this, it's self-replacing. Um, you can graze it and gee, it grows back. Um, which is significantly better than anything that arrives on a truck in terms of feed. Um, so it's pretty magic stuff. I would like to um, get this to do something. I'd like to talk about a few topics today that I think are quite topical and they're questions we're getting asked around at the moment and cover about six things. And I'll cover these reasonably quickly. Um, and whip through them and we can hopefully have some questions at the end. Um, why renew pasture, repairing wet weather damage, I'll just spend a couple of minutes on that because that's topical at the present. Um, so the weather's been pretty good the last couple of weeks. Um, smarter renewal programs and I'll spend a bit more time on that. Um, I think there's huge potential in the South Island of New Zealand to, to do better renewal, um, to spend our renewal dollar more wisely and get better returns. A bit on sowing methods, a bit on seed mixes, we're often mix, asked about different things, probably the two things at the moment are tetraploids versus diploids. Um, Link University dairy farms use a lot of tetraploids and, and how's that fitting in. In plantain also, um, it's a, a pretty uh, hot topic and getting a lot of questions about that at the moment. And I'll comment if we've got time a little bit on regenerative agriculture because um, that's also been quite a debate. Um, uh, so we'll fire in. So firstly, why renew pastures? And I guess um, just quickly, there's a, there's, a, there's a few different things. Development, I'm not going to talk about. Um, repair from events like wet weather, I'll talk about in a minute. Part of a crop rotation, historical and a cost benefit analysis. And I think we do one to four pretty well. And I think there's not a lot of uh, people doing number five well. And that's where I'm going to focus on today. And, and because, hey, there's some real opportunity and there's some real uh, good tools now that we can use to um, do smarter pasture, uh, pasture renewal programs. And I've just put a little box there to remember um, Benefits of new pasture can be threefold. We tend to focus on, hey, we get an extra yield, you know, two or three or four tonne or whatever it is. But we also get extra feed value or metabolizable energy, ME. And the science says somewhere between 0.5 and 0.8 um, uh, megajoules of ME. But we also get higher utilization. And that's generally because we get rid of some things we don't want. Um, and here in the South Island, a lot of our dairy farms are blessed with Coxfoot, Sweet Vernal, Brome Grass, Yorkshire Fog, Brown Top, a um, whole range of things that are from our sheep farming background from a lot of cases 20 years or 30 years ago. 
so um, they're not as palatable as a new pasture. So we add those three things up and uh, it gets quite exciting. So we'll fire into number two, the, the renewal for, from um, repair from events. And this was just a, a, a topical thing to do and just a, a reminder for guys um, that uh, renewal can be uh, quite, uh, sorry, hugging damage or treating damage can be quite catastrophic. That was a great photo I took um, two months after a single event. Um, hopefully no one has a situation like that. Um, this was a complete and utter death of a pasture. Um, unfortunately, a um, in manager was moving on and he wasn't taking a lot of care of what was doing. But the diagram I wanted to share today, and it's, and it's a little bit of a thinking one and um, uh, about damage from any event, but particularly at the moment we can get wet weather or you might have winter damage. And um, we've got a situation where uh, we've got a pasture at the start on the left hand side. It might be a, a good pasture is maybe 70 to 80 percent of desirable species. By oh, that's, that's the stuff you've sown, the ryegrass, the clover, um, whatever it is you've sown. And it, it always has weeds. Now, when you've got weeds at 20 percent or less, they just sit there and they're part of the animal's diet. They're not too much of a problem at low levels. But through time, as you go along, you might have this event where uh, something's happened, um, a treating event or a pugging event. You caught it heavy rain at two o'clock in the morning and, um, or a week of wet weather. And what happens is we lose our desirable species and we have a lag period and then the bare ground is taken up for weeds. So it's just, uh, it's a nice diagram because it shows you we've got a race um, and the secret, I think one of the secrets for keeping every square metre of your dairy farm at full productivity is making sure we've got desirable species. So pretty easy to do if you've got damaged or areas. Um, probably the easiest thing to do is just highlight the areas on a map with a marker pen give the farm map to your, to your uh, contractor and just get them to under sow some seed or um, spread some seed on. Under sowing usually works better. So it's quite a good way to whip around and, and just address those areas and keep the weeds out. Um, yes. Any questions so far, Claire? Um, yeah, there's one come through just wondering how we can get our clover content higher when regrassing. Should we be using different types such as white, red, etc.? Okay, well, can I come back to that at the end because I, I'm going to be talking about species. So let's yeah. hold that question and I'll, um, I'll talk about that and I'll talk a little bit when we get to the how to actually sow. Um, but it's a good question and topical because uh, <laughs> The environmental uh, side and the limits of nitrogen clovers, uh, um, it's always been important, but even more so. So good question. I guess sort of what, what we're trying to do with um, pasture renewal and this cost benefit, this, this opportunity I see, but this is the, the, the guts of it from a, it's either a yield, um, and basically we have usually on a farm a normal distribution of you like of these paddocks and, and um, we got some in the middle and the, your average production might be 15 ton and you've got a tail end doing maybe 10 ton and, and a top end doing 18 plus ton. That's a pretty normal distribution. And I think on every farm we've ever analyzed, every dairy platform we've ever analyzed, we have had a 100% difference in yield between the best and worst paddocks. And then I, I say that again, 100% difference in yield. So gee, there's some, some, some money to be made, some opportunity to um, improve things and improve our pasture productivity. Um, so that's sort of the guts of yield. And the one on the right, I've, I've just had a, um, a photo that um, I, I either love or hate. Um, those are actually tall fescue plants that have got completely out of control. Hopefully you don't have a pasture like this, but the other part of pasture renewal is just often paddocks where you put the cows in and the milk goes down. 
uh, they just don't milk well off the paddock or um, they just won't hit residuals and, and you've got to get it in there with a mower or the constant quality issue. So some, sometimes it's yield and usually you focus on yield, but also you might have paddocks that have um, ME or utilisation issues and, and that ranks them up as well in terms of their need. So how do you actually assess what's growing and just think about it? And, and um, this is a real simple way of, of, for guys who want to um, go the low tech approach. Um, and basically you put up a sheet in, in the cow shed or office and you tick a paddock each time it's grazed. And um, you will find on a dairy farm that some pastures will be grazed, the good pastures maybe 12, 13, 14 times a year, and the poor pastures will be grazed eight or nine times a year. And it's, it's basically that simple. Um, really easy when you've got paddocks the same size, but that diagram just as, is also on the right hand side of the table, adjusting for the fact that if you've got different paddock sizes, um, that you might have to adjust the bigger paddocks you uh, might be in more often because of a larger size. So just a pretty simple low tech way. Show you the big differences. Um, but there's also other ways we can do it and I think which are quite interesting and um, we can get the sort of output nowadays and these graphs you can spit out of um, pasture coach um, or uh, AgriNet, or Minder Land and Feed, or these software programs. And what you do is hit the right button to give you a paddock growth rate for a period, um, usually the preceding year. And um, this is the one for actually the Marlborough Monitor Farm um, that we did some work with uh, a few years ago. Um, I've picked this one because it's it's a nice data set and I've already had the graphs drawn up, so it was nice and easy to pick this one. And I think what you can see on, um, on this uh, graph is that um, some of the paddocks are producing very well on the very left hand side, paddock A2 on 22 tonnes, and way down here at the bottom, paddock B22, um, not producing very well at all. So, Let's just take you through a few steps of sort of the logic and I'm going to spend a little time on this graph and, and do a few things to it that just um, hopefully give you a bit of an idea of how you use this data, why you want to do it for your farm and, and what, it, what it actually is, it establishes. So the first thing is, well, we've got a potential missing yield and what we can say is, hey, the best paddock on the farm, A2, um, we can draw a line off there and say, well, maybe every paddock on the farm should be at that production of A2. So that's the uh, potential missing yield. And um, so we can quantify that by putting an arrow um, and showing that the, the poorest paddock on the farm, B22, is uh, missing out on eight and a half tonnes of dry matter yield. So, um, gee, that's pretty exciting, isn't it? We could renew that and, and, and capture that and all that yellow area. Huge potential. Unfortunately, it's not quite that simple. And what we do need to do is look at different parts of the farm. If your whole farm's the same and it's all under the same system or a similar soil type or a similar irrigation, that's easy. But if you have different areas like the Monitor Farm in Marlborough has, um, we need to, to separate those. So that farm has some flat irrigated, it's the most productive land, then some rolling irrigated where the irrigation system isn't as good and there's a bit of runoff, and then it's got some summer dry country. So if we split the farm into that and then actually use the top of each of those paddocks, the top rolling irrigated, the top flat irrigated, the top dryland paddock, we can actually look at um, what we what our potential is much more accurately. And this might be for your farm if you've got uh, some under a pivot or some under a rotorana or 
um, some drylands versus some wet, and, and um, you start getting a good, a much more accurate um, picture of the potential and your expectations, and more realistic about where you should capture. And I guess what, what, what the big picture is, hey, B22 wasn't that exciting after all, even though it's the lowest producing paddock. Um, and actually this one, B26, and um, uh, almost invariably on farms, the, the paddocks to renew first are the worst pastures or paddocks on the best part of the farm. They're usually the sitters for renew. And there are about six and a half tonnes of dry matter sitting there on paddock. B26, and um, you can see, uh, gee, uh, pasture renewal, we tend to think anything three tonnes of dry matter or more starts getting very economic for renewal, so there's probably about 10 or 15 paddocks on this farm that you could easily um, look at renewing in some shape or form. So um, when you get this data, um, pretty exciting. The other thing about doing um, this sort of analysis, which is um, great, is that I've had farmers who have um, chosen their paddocks for renewal. And then I've said, let's just crunch through in the software and do this analysis. And um, they've chosen the wrong paddocks. And um, Quite often we choose ugly paddocks um, and paddocks we just don't like for whatever reason. And, and, and some, sometimes that's, that's a good uh, decision. But I remember one of the times with a very smart farmer that he chose six paddocks for renewal and five of those six were in the top third of production of his farm. And uh, he couldn't believe that he was um, choosing actually what were pretty productive paddocks. And uh, so we cho uh, chose different paddocks and away we went with a, a much smarter renewal program. Um, there's, not, uh, there's a range of things that we can do when we do this sort of program. And um, this is a, a, a paper, I'll put the reference on it, the Journal of New Zealand Grass in 77. Um, this was a, uh, a paper for the New Zealand Grasslands Journal where um, we looked at two years of sowing Italian ryegrass versus old unsown pastures on Leo Donker's place at Tiparita. So he wanted to get into renewal in a, in, a, in a big way. He identified the underperforming paddocks. He had a lot of grass weeds, so we wanted a double spray program. And uh, what he's done here is we've got 14 paddocks of Italian sown over two years. So he's putting in seven paddocks each year for two years. And there are about 90 under, unsown paddocks as a control. So when we, we look at the, the following year's graph of how they performed, we can um, look at the pasture yield of the unsown, unrenewed paddocks was about 12.8 tonne. And we could pick up that the Italian was about 14 and a half because we had this paddock growth record. So the benefit of Italian ryegrass about 1.7 tonne. So we can actually quantify it and get some confidence um, in the fact that the renewal program was working. We had some ME uh, 11, the old unrenewed pastures weren't that palatable and well grazed where the Italian ryegrass sown in spring, um, uh, didn't go to seed for the first year, absolutely palatable, very high ME. Um, so you calculate the ME growing from that. Utilisation of the Italian was certainly much higher than the old unrenewed pasture, it had a lot of weed content. Um, so you convert through to milk um, and you put a value of milk solids and you come up with a value that um, within the first 12 months, so, uh, sorry, Within the first, um, this was sown in October, um, September, end of September and mid-October, and this was taken through to the 31st of May. So what's that? That's about eight months of uh, benefit. And over that eight months following a spray drill of Italian, 
it grew 1.7 tonnes and um, produced about uh, $1,000 more um, benefit, uh, even with the $550 cost of renewal. So tripled your money within eight months for a program. So this is the power of smarter renewal of, of actually having the paddock records and actually analyzing what you do. So any questions on that, Claire? I'm gonna... Not on this, yeah. Someone was asking about um, pugging though. So there, what's the best way to regrass a pugged up paddock in the winter that is wet on top? Um, yeah, so um, it, the, the, the easiest way, um, if it's just little areas in a gateway, you can sprinkle some seed on top, um, and uh, it, you know, and that doesn't work the best, um, but it will work. And for small areas, it's quite an easy thing to do: have a bucket of seed and throw it on. If you've got any sort of bigger area um, and it's still reasonably smooth and okay, just under sowing. It's the easiest way: get a contractor in and drill. 10 to 15 kgs of a diploid or a bit more of a tetraploid. Um, if it's fairly rough, you might just need to surface work it and then drill it. So um, generally you're just trying to get good seed soil contact of, of a pasture and put it in. Yeah. Great, thanks. No worries. Um, I'm happy to help more on a one-to-one -one because these this sort of presentation has got to be fairly ge generic. Um, so what happens at LEDF, because you know, part of the thing to do was the involvement of, of Linky University Dairy Farm, and, and how does it handle this? Well, Lincoln, and this is last year's one for the Lincoln University Dairy Farm, and our productive units, are, are we've, we've decided they're three different soil types. Um, the Wakanui's, the Templeton's, and the Tamuka. And the, this, to be honest, there's not too much difference between the Wakanui's and the Templeton soils, but the Tamuka is not good at soil in terms of it's a very heavy clay. And we just can't get the same production of those heavy Tamuka soils as we can the rest of the farm. And so um, we do the same thing here as, as the Marlborough farm where we just take the best paddock, for example, in the Templeton soils, S2 has been the best paddock. And we said that's the potential of the farm. So let's look at, at, at where we are in terms of um, renewal. And um, if, if any of you know the, the LEDF, you'll see that the, 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 the paddock with the most potential is N11. So, um, and then the next step we, we do is discuss those individual paddocks because if you know LEDF, N11 is right beside the cow shed. Um, it's uh, where the sick cows go a lot. It's um, where little mobs, lame cows and whatever. So it is very unfairly treated. So we sort of actually put N11 to the side and um, Last year, N3 was our top candidate, and we renewed this that on the farm. And based on the fact that you can see that there's still about three and a half, four tons of, of dry matter missing from N3, so we certainly do this um, for Lincoln, and uh, we've got a very flat production curve across the farm because we really do target the underperforming paddocks. Um, and the other side just on Lincoln and this graph is very messy and I don't expect you to do get too much out of it on the screen, except this is um, 14 years data of paddock growth rates. And this shows you the power of, of this analysis um, of paddock growth rate. The red is if, when that paddock was renewed and then we can follow the progress of each paddock that was renewed and get feedback whether we were successful. And for a lot of farmers, um, this is pretty important because um, sometimes we get really good results from renewal and sometimes we don't. When, and we need to know that and, and um, stop doing the bad things and, and um, keep doing the good things. And just in terms of what we can analyze and tell you from the LEDF. This is the sort of 
top line cost benefit analysis. We spend about $1,000 on renewable hectare, a little bit over $1,000. In the first season, so within the first season, we get a small gain, basically a break even in terms of um, benefit. Um, so we, we get paid back, I think it works out about $1,300. That we've also taken some cost of extra milk solids production out of in this equation the way we've done it to give you more data if you like but the overall thing of the benefit is about six and a half thousand dollars over the next five years um, based on that milk price so we know that we can we have done very successful renewal and that's given us a lot of confidence to keep investing in renewal and uh, the LEDF has done somewhere between 5% and 20% renewal each year. And it's purely driven on how many paddocks we can find. There's no uh, set budget. If we can't find bad paddocks, we'll, we, we won't renew them. So I think that's all I'm gonna say about um, sort of renewal planning, Claire. I don't know if there's any questions on sort of that setting areas or no. synergies. Fine. Yeah, not at this moment. Cool. So um, that's that's the most exciting area in terms of getting getting our head around that and doing the right amount of renewal. So when you go into sowing methods and and let's get into some of the details of sort of how to renew the sort of the, the more practical stuff. And um, one of the big things um, we we see is. Um, differences in sowing method and um, this comes back also to the question of clover um, and this this comes here. Um, I've put two little diagrams that sort of explain um, what, what we would like on the left, some sort of roller drill or broadcast seed or spread it out um, and what we don't like on the right um, which is the drill rows. And the reason we have um, drills with um, often six inch rows or 15 centimeter rows is that's what's good for cereal. Pasture doesn't like that. And um, what you have in a drill row, a tight drill row, is the, the, the seeds are absolutely jammed in against each other and particularly the clover suffers. Meanwhile, all the space between rows allows your power and docks and everything else to come up. So um, I hate rows. Um, I love broadcast seed because um, one of the, the, the key rules to pasture management is a good dense pasture is weed control. If you've got weeds in your paddock, you have got bare ground. So what we're trying to do is, is give, give good weed control. And if we can spread seed out, if you need the direct drill, maybe diamond drill or cross drill. So we're going in two directions and helping fill in the gaps. Um, if you can have a, a, find a drill with five inch row spacing, much better than six. If you can find one with four and a half inch row spacing, even better again. Um, it pays to really look, look around. Also, we have guys with direct drill who put clover and some ryegrass, maybe five kgs per hectare on with a small seed box and just dribble it in front of the drill and then drill the other uh, ryegrass seed in rows behind it. So that helps again spread the seed out and, and, and fill in the rows. So there's a number of things we do and, and um, the, 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 and the question on clover was really important because you can see on the left, there's a lot of space for plants, whereas in the right, in the rows, clover is slower to establish than ryegrass and really gets crowded out. So any questions on that? Nope. Cool. Um, and another one that's just a reminder, and hopefully not too many people are doing this now, but we still get people, and um, it comes up from time to time, are just putting short-term plants in a permanent pasture. This might be a bit of annual ryegrass, or it could be a rape, or you know, just something that um, 
is going to die. And um, if you're doing a permanent pasture, you want it to persist for as long as possible. We suggest every plant should be um, a permanent plant and as persistent as possible because in the first winter, the short-term plants often establish better and we get a bit of extra nip-off. But then several years later, they've died and we might get some clover come into the gaps, but usually we get docks or buttercups or pyre or brown top or sweet fernal or crested dog's tail. And, and we, we've um, got a problem with persistence in that situation. Um, one, one of the, the questions that's coming up an awful lot at the moment is tetraploid rye grasses versus diploid rye grasses and how we should use those in, in a pasture. And um, the Linke University dairy farm started on this journey uh, over 10 years ago and, and pretty much the whole of the Linke University dairy farm is in tetraploids. Um, uh, apart from one paddock that Peter Hancock hates because um, and the cows just don't like diploids. If they're given these tetraploids or tetraploid mixes, um, they, they, they don't like diploids anything like as much. And this is what this diagram at the top is trying to explain. There's, I mean, there's no silver bullets. I can't give you any silver bullets that are going to solve your problems. And everything's a compromise. So when, when we have... Um, a tetraploid on the left versus a diploid on the right or a mix in the middle. As we get more tetraploid, we, we increase palatability, but we lose robustness. Diploids are denser, finer, they've got more tillers, um, they are certainly tougher. So if persistence is your absolutely key requirement and you're in a tough particularly dryland situation, probably diploids are the way to go. But if you're under irrigation and you've got reasonable grazing control, um, what we found is the tetraploid diploid mixes work pretty darn well. And Lincoln started on this um, probably about 15 years ago with, with a straight tetraploid, Beely in those days. And the straight tetraploid we um, found lasted three, four, five years. We, we just hammered them. They're so palatable and the cows just hammered them. So we went to the tetraploid diploid mix. And the reason we did that is it, 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 it toughens it up. And I think I've got a diagram here that sort of tries to explain because people say, don't, don't the cows graze the tetraploid out? And uh, the answer is no, because you've got about um, 4,000 tillers a square metre of this mix, and they're all completely intertwined. So um, the cows can't differentiate one from the other. The tetraploid, the dark green plants are a little bit taller and a little bit more upright than the finer, denser diploid plants, but they're mixed in. And what happens with a straight tetraploid is the cows graze down. They've got very, very soft stems. And we, we struggled to keep residuals up to 1,500 with straight tetraploids. Often they were down to 1,200, 1,300 and absolutely getting hammered. When you put the, the diploid in, it thickens the pasture. It makes it denser, but it actually makes it a little less palatable, which means it's got a bit more grazing resistance and it helps avoid the overgrazing of the tetraploids. So in that case, um, we've had very good results and um, the mix has gone very well. And as I said, the first diploid tetraploid mixes now are over 10 years old at um, LEDF. Um, their persistence is very good. In fact, in the last year, the top seven performing paddocks on the farm were diploid tetraploid mixes. Or a six paddock, sorry, on the farm with um, diploid tetraploid mixes. The reason we're so excited about this is that this means increased ME intake of cows um, and increased milk solids and easier grazing too because of the palatability. There are a few qualifiers around that because. Um, 
you need to get the allowance right. You can't just um, have a very high stocking rate and 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 squeeze more ME into into cows. They will certainly naturally eat more on tetraploids. So part of the tetraploid diploid mixes have been an absolute key part on the LDF's movement from 680 cows to 560 cows from cows going from about 410 up to about 505 kilograms of milk solids a hectare and, and keeping the milk production similar. And uh, that's given a 15% energy efficiency gain at LEDF. This is the trick to LEDF. The reason I say that, and if I can explain a little bit more, we've got, you used to have maintenance energy, about 80 megajoules a day going to 680 cows. We now got this 80 megajoules of maintenance energy a day going to 560 cows. So we've released about a, a ton of dry matter um, from maintenance energy that's been able to go into production. So the allowance per cow has gone up at Lincoln because we've leased cows and the tetraploids has really helped drive the intake and helped drive that milk solids. Um, the Lincoln is a, is a very interesting experiment in dropping your stocking rate and chasing higher milk solids production. Um, in the meantime, the, the nitrogen application's gone down and the um, nitrogen leaching as through overseer has dropped from about 46 to about 27 kilograms of N. So environmentally and, and, and profitability, it's been a very, very nice thing to do. So um, just understand tetraploids are a key part of that and something you may want to chase on your farm. If, if, uh, yeah, very exciting. Um, the one question we get asked all the time is the sowing rates. And as a general rule, um, we halve the normal tetraploid sowing rate, so the normal tetraploid sowing rate for ryegrass. It's big seed is about 30 kilograms a hectare. We drop that to about 15. The normal diploid sowing rate is about 20, so we drop that to 10. So about 15 kilos of a tetraploid, 10 kilos of a diploid, um, four or five kilos of white clover with that, um, and that's sort of the base mix of, of, of what we're doing at Lincoln. Any questions on that, Claire? Nope, not at this point. Cool. Um, plantain. And um, the, 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 uh, there are a number of plantains. Um, Baron Brook, Brook produce plantain now. We sell it and, and um, there's a lot of interest in it at the moment with um, what it does on firms in terms of decreasing nitrate leaching. And I guess the, the summary and, and where we are, um, it doesn't actually change milk solids production. It's, it's, um, it's, it seems to improve it in the summer, but it isn't quite as good as uh, in the early spring. So overall, the effect on milk solids is not great. But the exciting thing about the, the plantain is it decreases nitrate leaching. Um, and it's now been put into the overseer model. Um, as a box, you can tick. Although at present, be aware it has no value and it's not giving any credit at the moment. That is still being worked through. Um, it certainly has a range of things and the ones they're looking at with overseer is its work as a diuretic. Um, in terms of um, producing more urine and, and a weaker urine, um, and also uh, its protein partitioning within the animal. So there's more protein maintained in the animal and less excreted um, with plantains. But at, at Lincoln, we've been struggling with a couple of things um, with, with uh, plantain. Um, that we haven't really got any solutions to. It does create issues with weed control. Um, we've seen a, 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 a significant increase in a number of weeds because um, 
we've got problems with herbicides and, and herbicide choice and that side of things with using plantain in the mix. And also in general, we had, had created, it's created issues in thinning pastures after two or three years. So we have often been under sowing more rye grass into pastures because particularly with the spring sowing, plantain is very strong. It loves spring sowing and it, and it, and it establishes very well. We've only been using about two kilograms per hectare, but it, it produces 30 or 40% of the dry matter through the first season. It's incredibly strong. Uh, and then it tends to drop out and a lot, um, probably left with about half as much plantain in year two and, and probably only five or 10% of what you originally sown. So we end up with thin pastures. So we've got no real solutions. Um, I know Peter Hancock's at the LEVF is looking at possibly dropping plantain out of his permanent pasture mixes this spring. Um, and how, how we might look at putting it in in future might be with under sowing older or run out pastures or that type of way because it is creating problems with our new sowings. Yeah. Any questions on that, Claire? Nope. Cool. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about regenerative agriculture because, um, again, we're getting uh, a lot of questions on this. And, um, um, and, and just to, I guess, we've been asked to give an opinion on it uh, quite a few times. And um, I, I think I've just made a few points. And what I would say and very strongly that New Zealand has a pastoral system with over 80 years of science and knowledge that, um, built on the, the, the shoulders of giants, the Bruce Levies, the Ray Brahms. Uh, there's, there's a lot of fantastic pasture science and knowledge on management and grazing and animal interactions. And we should all be very proud of it. It's a, it's a phenomenal thing. The re regenerative agriculture has come come largely out of the states, and and um, it's come here with a few people, and and its major aims are looking after soil and increasing carbon in the soil, and those are great things, and and I I applaud re the regenerative agriculture movement because in some cases we've been overlooking these things, and this is what we should be doing. Um, Regenerative agriculture has a number of parts to it. One is uh, rotational grazing, um, and they've discovered rotational grazing in the States and, and where this has come from in, in low carbon soils, and it, and it increases carbon rotational grazing, but we have been doing that a number of years here already. Um, direct drilling is another part of um, regenerative agriculture, and certainly that's something that's been um, available here. I remember Colin Baker and the Baker Boot development in the 1980s at Massey University and, and it's certainly something that's available and we should be doing more of. Um, the, the, the trouble is, and I guess the issue that we, we just have is the lack of science behind the claims around regenerative agriculture. And um, that's, just, I guess, a word of caution. Um, listen to, to what's being said, but just look for the science behind uh, what has been, been said about the claims. And uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Um, so I've got a question coming in about Regen Ag, saying that it often call, calls for 20 plus species going into a new sward. What's your view on that? Many will be shaded or grazed out quickly. Is it a waste of money? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so again, um, but yeah, I, I've heard of 20 species, 30 species, 50 species, and, you know, and, and does it work? Well, A, there's no science. So um, show me the, 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 the information that says they work. The, the, the science we have um, largely on this area, I think uh, the best people who worked on this are Derek Moot and Alistair Black at Ute Lincoln University. And their uh, comments is that you can have three species in a mix. You can have a grass, a legume, and a herb. And um, possibly a couple of 
couple of cultivars within the grasses or that type of thing. But once you start uh, getting a whole range of things, they will just not survive. And particularly some of the things that have been putting into the mixes. I mean, and we're getting, as a seed company, we're getting requested for these seed mixes with um, borage and um, sunflowers and different things. They, they just won't, can't withstand grazing. Um, so if you want to graze their pasture, um, <laughs> and we even struggle with, you know, things like lucerne, putting them into a mix. A lucerne likes to be grazed four times a year. Ryegrass likes to be grazed about 10 or 12 times a year and, and lucerne will die out. Red clover will struggle in a, in a high performance cherry farm pasture. Um, and the reason plantain is, uh, is dying is it likes a, a longer rotation than ryegrass in a lot of cases. Cool. Um, another question is, can you under sow plantain? And if so, at what rate? Yeah, so um, we've had some good successes with um, under sowing plantain um, in the spring. And we've sown it usually with a little bit of ryegrass, maybe um, five kilos of ryegrass and a, and a couple of kgs of plantain. The trick is to have some open ground under sowing so we're, we're not talking spray drill we're talking about an existing pasture where we put a, a direct drill through the, the paddock and if you have some open and bare soil again that diagram that I showed right at the start about the race between you and the weeds um, plantain with spring under sowing works very well and it's really exciting because you see all this plantain come up and and and, and you, you know you know know you you've got a bit of payback for your money great um yeah that's the rest of the questions do you have anything more to say on increasing your clover content when regrassing or did you cover that um yep so um well i'll just before i get conclusions and um sort of okay so increasing clover content <laughs> I suppose the, in, in the clover content of our pastures in general, the, the survey work done in New Zealand suggests it's probably around 15% at best of our pastures. Um, and um, ideally it should be about 30%. And there's some good reasons for that. Um, kilo for kilo compared to ryegrass, clover produces 30% more milk. It also fixes nitrogen, 25 kilograms of, of N per tonne of, of clover, dry matter growing. Um, I mean, it's, it, and, and nitrogen is going to be um, more important to us to be fixed from the air where we're going to get limits on bag um, or, or bag, bag fertiliser nitrogen. Um, so we do have an issue. So what should we do? Well, at the moment, um, I would be going around and looking across the farm and scoring paddocks. And if you have low clover content in the paddocks, I would look at trying to over sow clover this spring. And it's a fairly simple thing to do. You want to put on about four or five kgs of coated clover seed. Ideally, two or three days before grazing. Um, and I say that just with a couple of uh, cautionary notes. Um, it's better to put it on before grazing, um, two or three days before grazing, um, and get the animals to trample it in. So when you go in and graze, they'll they'll hoof and tooth it into the soil. Ideally, in slightly damp conditions, or you know, so we get it pushed against the the soil. In the South Island, we should start doing that in sort of beginning of October through October into early November under irrigation. Um, that works really well. It likes the warm temperatures. And um, make sure if you're using coated seed to use one without chemicals. Coated seed has better ballistics. It spreads better. It, um, it, if you're putting it in with fertilizer, you want coated seed to stop seed burn. But the thing about um, seed coating is you've got to be careful. Some of it's got insecticides and fungicides, and you don't want those in animals in milk if you're putting it on. They've got a 40 day withholding period. So if you're putting on coated seed, you'll find there are some coatings that are just lime. 
Uh, the one we sell, sell, to mention a trade name, is Agricoke Overso. So you can get um, clover. I think the one PGG rights and sell is called Krill Coat Clover. So um, that coating is one you want without the chemical. Throw it on the paddocks, away you go. And finally, if you're sowing, <laughs> sowing new, paddock, new pastures of clover, um, you know, make sure you spread the seed out, get the drilling depth right. Clover wants to be drilled within 10 millimeters of the soil surface. We're drilling at, at 20 millimeters or deeper, you, you'll just really slow your clover establishment. Spread the seed out of rows, broadcast it, whatever, and then just look after it. It likes the light. Um, someone's asking if clover, does it compete okay in diploid tetrapoid mixes? Uh, yes, it seems to compete a little bit better, and um, the, the reason is that when we put the tetraploid mixes in, um, the palatability improves, the residuals are, are met more easily and more consistently, and the one thing clover loves is light. It wants light on the stolons and the base to, to thrive. So when we have that, that, that light down there, and, and we tend to get it better with tetrapoid mixes, so we see more clover. Cool, and someone's also asking, what about over sowing clover in the North Island on dry land in terms of when and what rate? Yep, so, so dry land, um, it, it's exactly the same trick as, as what I've mentioned for the South Island, it's just earlier. So your soil temperatures are a lot warmer. So generally we would start by about um, mid-September. I'd be thinking about putting clover for about the next month through to about mid-October. So in the North Island you want it earlier because you know there's a potential summer dry, um, but also your soil temperatures are, are much higher so you can start, start earlier. And um, the nice thing about spring sowing, clover loves spring sowing. Um, it's warm active. And also white clover is tap rooted for the first sort of 12 to 80 months of its life. So um, those clover seedlings are pretty darn drought, drought tolerant through, through the first um, summer. Cool. And then is there any specific fertilizer requirements they should be checking for in soil tests with regards to clover? Yes, and I, I probably should have, should have mentioned that. So if, if you take a, take a backtrack and, 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 and it's a good question, just take a wider view of clover. And I guess if you haven't got a lot of clover on your farm, the question is why? And um, so uh, check your soil fertility levels, um, make sure. Probably the, the one thing we, we've been a little light on is potash in terms of clover. And certainly on a number of farms, we've seen a, a strong, um, response of clover to potash. Um, just be aware it's not on every farm, it either is or it isn't, so you need to check your soil tests. If, if you've got ongoing problems with clover and if you are really concerned about clover, one thing that is quite uh, very good to do that we've done sometimes is to go out and actually herbage test clover plants in the paddock. So if you go out and collect individual clover plants, throw them in a bag and do a herbage test, that will give you a, a lot more specific picture of what's happening with nutrients than a soil test will. A soil test is a fairly general sort of availability snapshot. And the herbage test, particularly um, things like molybdenum, um, clover needs molybdenum to fix nitrogen, it's a critical element, so it'll, it'll rule out whether that's an issue or not, and it'll t tell you what the potash levels are in the clover and that type of thing. So um, it, it's an extra test, but um, well worth doing if, if, if you're serious about clover and you've got ongoing issues. Great, thanks. Cool. So um, I'll, I'll just finish up with some conclusions and I guess um, the, you know, the, 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 you know, what I've sort of been sharing today and I guess some thoughts around pasture renewal uh, um, with a particularly focus on the South Island with, with um, our programs here. Um, the, the wet weather race, it's, it's, it's a race with the weeds and um, 
you know, that's one of the, the things I mentioned that um, we have this issue where we damage the desirable species. They turn into whatever your favourite weed is, whether it's docks or car or uh, brown top or whatever. Um, Analyse paddock growth versus potential for the right renewal program and um, 5%, 10%, 20%, 30%. I've got no idea what your right renewal program is, but by gosh, there's some underperforming paddocks out there. And um, I can tell you that renewal, uh, we, we calculated internal rates of return of 200, 300% on, on the right program. It is just incredibly economic. Um, and it, analysis of paddock growth rates and things allows you to choose the right paddocks. Because as I mentioned, um, I've been on farms, I was on a farm a couple of years ago in the Waikato, very interesting where we did the analysis and we found the best paddock and the worst paddock on the farm. One was producing somewhere around 17 or 18 tonnes and the other was producing about eight or nine tonnes, about half. Paddocks were side by side. We walked both pastures, couldn't tell the difference. And visually, had no idea, they both looked reasonable pastures and neither looked flash and whatever but it was quite amazing that the cows had been in one paddock twice as often so um it's it was that was a real wake-up call to me that we need to be smarter and and a lot of this visual identification of paddocks the the the, the, the there's a lot of um good analysis to do and then finally just the two rules of of pasture renewal and um there's only two rules and uh um, number one is establish a good pasture of high quality seed genetics and, and I very firmly believe that. Obviously, I'm a little biased working for, uh, you know, in the, in the plant breeding area, and, um, but we do see this all the time and there's an open invitation to come and visit uh, us at Barrenbrook at our research farm or any of our trials to have a look at, at how things stack up and why we get so excited. And number two is don't stuff it up. and. Um, doesn't always happen. I mean, the, there are problems on a farm and if you get a couple of weeks of wet weather, you've got to have the cow somewhere. So we understand that. Um, but we've also had paddocks on, on the Link University dairy farm. I'm thinking uh, at the moment, S2 was the best performing paddock on the farm. It's, it's, it's growing the best part of 20 tonnes a year and has done for 11 years. So it's having 12, 12 grazings a year. So it's having, it's had, um, you know, 120, 130 grazings. And those 120 and 130 grazing events have all gone well. But all it takes is one thing to stuff it up and um, we're back into the renewal phase again. So um, have processes in place that try and look after things and wet weather plans and uh, dry weather plans as well. So um, yeah, so you can look after this, this um, good pasture that you've established. So thank you, Claire. Cool, thank you, Graham. Well, that was awesome, really informative. Um, yep, so we'll wrap up uh, our August webinar today and we'll be back on September 1st with Peter and Jeremy for the virtual farm visit. Thanks, bye. Thanks, Claire.